Hey guys, this is Slow Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and I wanted to let you guys know about the first Mises event of 2024. On February 17th, we will be returning to beautiful Tampa, Florida for an event dedicated to inflation, causes, consequences, and the cure. While the government tries to hide the consequences of inflation in their official statistics, Americans see and feel it every time they visit the grocery store. The state and its media lapdogs try to blame inflation on corporate greed, but the true source of inflation is the Federal Reserve and the banking system. We're going to be tackling this issue with a great lineup of speakers, including Joseph Salerno, Patrick Newman, and our new Mises president, the great Tom DeLorenzo. Uh, we have a special code for Radio Rothbard viewers for a 15% discount. That's uh, Rothbard24. And you can uh, find more about this event at Mises.org slash Tampa 2024. Hey, guys, this is The Bitch with Radio Rothbard, and we've got another great offer for Radio Rothbard listeners. We have a free book that we want to send directly to your doorstep. If you are a fan of this show, you have no doubt heard us discuss Murray Rothbard's classic Anatomy of the State his dive into the mechanics of the state as we know it, what the state fears, what its greatest threats are. It is one of the all-time best Rothbard reads, a personal favorite of both myself and Ryan. You can get your free copy as a Radio Rothbard listener by visiting Mises.org slash RothPodFree. That's R-O-T-H-P-O-D free. You can also find the link in our show notes. Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me, of course, is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And this time, our guest is Mark Thornton. We try to have him on at least every six weeks, talk about the economy, um, and he, of course, has his own uh, short-form podcast that is Minor Issues. And if you're not listening to any of those, make sure and check that out. This are just, these are basically frequent updates on what's going on with the economy and what should be your takeaway from, uh, for example, the sort of thing the media is trying to feed you about where the economy is headed right now. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more at length about some of these recent issues that have been going on over the past month. Or so, and I think just to get started, we can just talk about the most recent Fed meeting. Uh, the uh, FOMC met recently, and then, as uh, has been the case since about 2011, they had a press conference afterward, where supposedly you you grill the uh, the, the chairman uh, Jerome Powell nowadays, but of course, there's very little grilling going on. It's mostly uh, softball questions from the media. Occasionally, you get a decent question in there. Uh, but the the what we were told by the media and the takeaway from this meeting, Powell comes out and he's talking about the, what the FOMC has found. And in terms of rate changes, uh, there weren't any. And so the rate stays at about 5.5%, uh, depending on the, the minute you're looking at uh, in terms of what the effective rate are, is. But the planned rate, is uh, maxes out at 5.5%. This is for the federal funds rate, and it um, has broader implications in the economy in terms of uh, how high interest rates are uh, more broadly. And the the impression we were, were given uh, at this meeting and afterward, especially in the talk around the media, is that Powell had struck a softer, more dovish tone, that he was leaning more toward uh, lowering rates again because... Uh, the the inflation had softened, things were still looking pretty good, the employment situation was good, and so inflation has been addressed, and now we can get back to losing rates. Powell didn't say this stuff explicitly, as is usually the case with, uh, with uh, FOMC uh, personnel, but that was the general, I think, feel that a lot of people took away from it. So now we're left with the question of, okay, is the economy really as solid as Powell says it is, uh, or is it weaker than he says it is? And then, so is now the appropriate time to be lowering, be well, forcing back down the interest rate? That's what the Fed really does, is it forces down interest rates. Um, and so is now the appropriate time for that. And if it does force down interest rates, 
which would presumably increase the money supply indirectly. What does that mean for inflation? Have we really solved the inflation problem? So I'll take one of those questions one at a time, right? Uh, uh, Mark, have we solved the inflation problem? So has inflation gone away and now we can really start talking about ways to loosen up the money supply again? I don't think we've solved it at all. Uh, the inflation rate, as the government mentions it, or measures it, I should say, uh, still way above their target. And their target is way above zero. Um, and, you know, Austrians look at monetary systems like the gold standard where prices actually fell. So the norm on that system was that prices stayed about the same or they actually declined over time. So we're above all of that still. And there's nothing really to suggest that inflation won't rematerialize at higher levels. In other words, prices may increase at a higher rate in the future, in the near-term future. Uh, the United Kingdom has experienced that, for example. Uh, and a lot of the decline in prices uh, has been, or excuse me, the disinflation or the fact that the consumer price index isn't rising as fast um, is due to things like energy prices. Okay, so energy prices, oil prices uh, came down uh, significantly. Natural gas prices came down significantly. So one of our main costs in households, transportation, and production came way down. Uh, and there's nothing to suggest uh, that those energy prices couldn't move much higher. Even though the world economy is weakening, I mean, you know, a significant war could break out in the Middle East or uh, in Eastern Europe or in China. And, you know, all bets are off. Uh, that price goes up and our inflation factor in the U.S. economy goes up rather than back down. Uh, the way everybody at the Fed and everybody uh, in terms of mainstream financial commentary would have it. Um, so I don't think inflation is dead whatsoever. Uh, the policy has not changed. The Fed itself has actually become somewhat more accommodative, not in terms of their target rates. Uh, in my New Year's resolution, Ryan, um, is to stop calling it the federal funds rate and to start calling it the centrally planned rate. Okay, so I'd hope all my friends uh, here at uh, the Mises Institute will join in that New Year's resolution and start referring to uh, what the Fed does for what it is. Well, that's a good point too, right? And I've mentioned that I think sort of on the side a little bit in these articles is that the Fed is really a central planning organization, right? Yes, it's you have. Picking this interest rate that it thinks will quote unquote work to achieve the central government's goals. And then it attempts to implement it through open market operations and, and other means. And this is a number as the work of Salerno and you have noted, right? This is not based on some scientific observation of the natural interest rate or anything like that. It's a number they made up. And, and then of course their target is 2%, which is a made up number. And uh, we, we might remind, I've made, noted many times that uh, federal legislation actually in the eighties stated a goal of 0%. Um, for, uh, I believe it was 1978, one of these uh, acts of legislation that adjusted the Fed, uh, the Fed's mission stated that by 1988, inflation should be 0%. Uh, but in the 90s, that all went all out the window. We decided it's 2% now. And then, of course, we're, we're almost double that still. Um, so where do these numbers come from? They're just made up. It's, it's, it's like a five-year plan that the Soviets might put in place. Our five-year plan for inflation is at an average of 2%. So, well, yeah. Well, this whole idea of targeting actually comes to us uh, from New Zealand, which got into a whole bunch of trouble in the 1990s with high inflation, currency devaluing, economy going down the tube, kind of the way it is right now and why they've elected a new government in New Zealand. But originally, they set an inflation target 
to get some reputation from for the central bank down there to not inflate. So they said, we'll bring inflation down to 3%. And we'll guarantee you that it will stay lower than 3%. Now, of course, um, you know, it's, it's not... Uh, you know, they've been talking about it in recent terms in the Fed, like, oh, we're trying to get it up to the target. And then, of course, lately they've been way over the target, so they're trying to get it back down to reestablish um, a reputation in markets. Well, and then that reputational aspect, it's, it's interesting because Powell has been very dead set. You know, he, he has spoken at length about his concerns about how difficult it is to rein back in this inflation monster once the public at large no longer has faith in the Fed's commitment to hit its stated goals. And the rhetoric between, you know, now him, you know, him basically having his George W. Bush moment of, you know, unveiling the mission accomplished banner at this last meeting saying, oh, well, you know, we, we're, we're confident that inflation will finally get down to 2% in 2025, 2026, I believe. <laughs> so he wasn't even predicting for 2024, signaling that rates were on the table, which immediately led to, and this is another joy of the Fed, is that now we have, um, you know, you, you don't simply listen to the Fed chair. You have the different governors out there, the different members of the FOMC that, you know, can't, Turned down a microphone anyway. So you had uh, Williams from the New York Fed saying, "Oh well, you know, just because you know, ignore what Powell said, there, you, know, I, you know, there's a possibility of no rate cuts next year." You have uh, uh, Goolsby from uh, Chicago saying, "There's no contradiction here." You have you know, within the dot plot, you had some members projecting three. The, the majority, the, the 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 plurality opinion was three rate cuts. You had others expecting two rate cuts. You had some expecting you know, five, six rate cuts. So there's, there's a, a communication. What, what, what the Fed has relied upon, its, its main tool for conducting policy in the post-Bernanke era in particular has been, as, as, along with their very aggressive you know, purchasing programs and QE, has been this expansion of communications tools and now when you're getting you're, you're getting all sorts of different contradictory information coming out of various members of the FOMC um, combined with just the historical record of how ridiculously off the Fed has been for its own projections of policy um, while markets are you know the, the various consultants and and Fed prognosticators and all of that um, you know they have their own projections and and the market you know prices in whatever kind of these these consultants and these these advisors are are, are predicting and them their their own try to reading of the tea leaves the the noise that is coming from our very wise monetary central planners um, is you know you, you can read these headlines and go in a variety of directions and then when again as listeners need to understand the extent to which. Uh, how much of uh, a financial trading is done by algorithms and you know various sort of uh, uh, bots and, and new tools that are you know skim uh, uh, x headlines for uh, for different strategies um, for some of these financial outlets. I mean, it, it is a uh, you know it, that helps uh, explain a lot of the clown world that we're in for for a variety of the issues plaguing us right now. Well, and yeah, my, will hit, oh, go ahead, Mark. Well, I was going to say my interpretation of what Powell did was that, well, first of all, he was very happy that long-term rates had come down. Government bond rates had already come down. Mortgage rates had already come down. And he was a little bit happy about all that. And that's why I think he conveyed uh, that message to continue these happy things that are going on in the marketplace. And of course, that immediately got trans, uh, translated into the Fed pivot. Everybody was talking about the Fed pivot. Um, not that there was a Fed pivot or that they were talking about a pivot, but that there might be a pivot sometime in the future, um, like in the spring. And so stocks went up again, bonds went up again. Um, interest rates softened again. Uh, the markets were very enthusiastic about that um, 
I don't know what you'd call it, just his Powell's happiness in the message that he conveyed to people. And I think the pushback comes from some of these other people because, and I talk about this on the Minor Issues podcast this weekend, is that Fed pivots uh, really are a sign that the economy is going right down the tubes and that the economy is going into a recession real soon if it's not already in recession. And if you look back at the historical charts, uh, a Fed pivot at this time of the business cycle is really a crisis response team effort. Okay, so they cut interest rates because the economy is going into a crisis or at least a recession. So I think that they wanted to sort of allay those kind of fears going forward that eventually the market would sober up, uh, would reevaluate as we headed into the end of the year and realize, hey, this Fed pivot is not a good thing. <laughs> Okay, it sounds good uh, right now to us under current circumstances, um, but in the long run, uh, a Fed pivot really is a sign that the party is over. Uh, Goldilocks is not making an appearance. The soft landing is not going to happen, and uh, the reputation gets worse uh, for the Fed and mainstream economists in general. Well, and you can see that too in the empirical data. If you just look at, okay, when does the Fed pivot occur, uh, and when do uh, when do rates start going down? They go down uh, several months ahead of the beginning of an official recession. Um, they they uh, they always talk about, oh, well, uh, we've already we've got the soft landing in the bag. Um, now the Fed can reduce rates and then everything will be fine. But it never seems to work out that way. What, what really happens is the Fed starts to reduce rates and then several months later, lo and behold, you're in a recession. So that's the much, much more common and likely outcome is what comes after the pivot, just as you note. Um, and you get so many mixed messages on it, I think they're just trying to get, have it both ways. Um, but I do think there's, and we, we can talk about this a little bit, I do think there is some genuine fear uh, among some of uh, some of the people on the committee, that if they do back off uh, interest rates too quickly, you could have a repeat of, say, the Burns years. And and uh, Powell used to speak much more explicitly in those terms, where we need to conquer inflation, or else if if we back off too fast, you have a resurge in inflation, just as you noticed noted. And I've uh, noted some people in financial Twitter uh, and in their columns. They've, uh, they're looking at the current trajectory and then overlaying it on the trajectory of the 1970s, where you had a significant slowdown in inflation in the mid-70s, and then Burns says, oh, okay, everything's fine now, let's, uh, let's force down interest rates again. And then you got the even larger wave of inflation from the late 70s and into the early 80s. So there's a fear that since that's happened before, it could certainly happen again. Uh, so that... I think that's a well-placed fear. I don't think we should assume everything will just work out the same way it did in the 70s. But um, when you're still looking at three, three and a half percent CPI rates, which aren't even reflecting the reality of grocery bills for many people, not to mention housing costs, uh, de declaring that uh, the war on inflation has been won is, is uh, problematic, to say the least. Yes, and uh, you know you've you've been writing a lot about uh, unemployment, and we've had lots of articles about the employment uh, in the economy. And one of the things in the mainstream media that sort of dropped off the page is the impact of COVID uh, on those numbers and the fact that has no longer in the public. Dis uh, discussion that so many people dropped out of the labor force. Uh, unfortunately, some people died. Uh, some people retired early. Uh, some people uh, re um, basically uh, stepped out of the workforce because of vaccine mandates uh, that we're still suffering from in terms of pilots and nurses and all sorts of really critical people in the economy. And then, of course, also the impact of COVID on markets. 
uh, a lot of people got filthy rich uh, because of the COVID stimulus, and they ended up with such high balances in their stock and bond portfolios that they decided, hey, why not drop out of the labor force and retire early? Uh, everybody out there probably is heard of or knows somebody who's a decade or more from normal retirement age, but has nonetheless retired or stepped away from the uh, labor force. So all of the numbers that are being reported by the government, these ultra low unemployment rates that we see, um, really it, in today's discussion, all of that part of the story gets dropped out and uh, we still have a major problem in labor markets in the United States. Yeah, I think once you – and this is something I, I've noted just in personal conversation and articles is once you dive down deeper and below the headline rates um, and you start to look at some of the fundamentals underlying the labor markets, uh, it's <laughs> it's not nearly as, as happy as Powell would have you believe in a lot of these – uh, a lot of his comments during the FOMC press conferences. And you can see this in temporary employment and job openings. And so many of the numbers are just haywire anyway, thanks to COVID. Uh, you've got to look more at trends than total numbers. And just talking to young people, talking to anyone under uh, age 35 or so, ask them how they're doing. And they all feel like expenses are unbelievably high especially people who are who are trying to have children or start a family of any kind. I mean, yeah, if you're a double income, no kids couple, and you, you're both doing pretty well, then you can keep your head above water pretty easily. But that's not the story for a lot of people. Yeah, we just had the resumption of student loan payments. I don't know how many people are paying back student loans right now. I'm sure it's in the tens of millions. Uh, but we had resumption of those payments recently, and in the first reporting period, 40% of those uh, failed to resume their payments. Now, I'm sure that's the result of some government paperwork uh, screw-up, that the number is not going to actually be 40% are failing to pay back their student loans, but it's going to be a large number. And even those that are paying it back, if you take several hundred dollars out of your existing weekly or monthly uh, earnings, all of a sudden that closes the door um, on your expenditure patterns and you've got to cut back on yet more things. Um, and that's uh, sort of a uh, another factor uh, almost like inflation. Inflation driving up the cost of everything uh, means that you have to stop buying things or you have to buy down uh, to lower amounts, lower qualities, substitutes. Uh, those student loan repayments are going to do the same exact thing and that's going to push the economy quicker towards a an official uh, recession, even if we don't see one for uh, a while, you can tell uh, through these stories and, and, and secondary statistics that a lot of people have already fallen into recessionary conditions, even if they have a job, even if they're still able to make their payments. Um, but, you know, there's increased car payment delinquencies, there's increased house payment delinquencies. Uh, from very low levels, but they are on the upswing. Uh, that's very troubling. I think uh, uh, Chairman Powell uh, is acutely aware of those things, and I think he's. But it wouldn't surprise me. It, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if you saw student loan delinquency rates, you know, maintain near that forty percent. Because I think there is a a a culture of, and, I, and to be fair, I, I think this is valid in many ways of, of, of grievance amongst young Americans that increasingly recognize that the economic system is, is stacked against them. There's a lot of angst over the issues with the, the, the housing market. There's a lot of angst um, with, again, just this, this general sort of understanding, um, again, as much as the Fed and, and Paul Krugman and all these other you know, 
reliable mouthpieces of the regime um, trying to sell us on how great and rosy and, and you know, surreally uh, positive the economic system is that the the prospects for younger Americans are down the tubes. And so there's a, a grievance of, you know, why, why should I pay back these, these ridiculous student loans, um, which I think has been further fueled by you know, the delay, you know, obviously the delay aspect on that specific, or specific type of debt um, that the government has built in for several years now, the rent moratoriums that were in the past. I mean, a lot of this sort of fuels a lot of the kind of the, the, the leftist mindset, this, this anti-capitalist mindset um, that is popular not only on the typical left-wing activists, but unfortunately with a lot of the, the young, you know, quote-unquote right-wing conservative types that have um, – that, that, that are, are embracing um, kind of left-wing – economics with with cultural conservative sort of values there um, which is a, a recipe in the long run for for absolute disaster um, and so that getting that culture of paying back debts of, of fiscal responsibility once that breaks it's very difficult to to bring back and so you know some of these you know, you know and this is something that you know a lot of our, our scholars have, have talked in great length about is that, that this this culture of economic responsibility is, very, is can, can be very fragile in a society, and that's one of the long-term trends that I'm very concerned about. Yeah, that's a great point, and I wish everybody would watch or listen to Professor Holtzman's address uh, to the recent Supporters uh, Summit conference uh, because he explains, um, you know, it, from the basis of Austrian economics why exactly the cards are set against uh, younger generations and uh, and what we need to do to reverse that, to balance that um, in, in terms of not stacking the deck uh, of inflation, taxation, nas uh, national debt, um, on these younger generations because it's uh, insidious uh, discouragement uh, to those younger generations in terms of their future outlook, family formation, um, and, and many other very personal things in people's lives. And so, you know, I wish more people would uh, listen to that talk or watch the video. It's really profound um, and, uh, and very much an easy lesson to absorb, I think, for, from just about everybody. Yeah. And one more thing, I want to go back to uh, the, the job numbers uh, as, as an issue because you know, along with um, some of the games that are played in terms of you know revisions made after the fact, after you get the nice little headline burst and all that sort of stuff, um, something that, that is worth noting is the role that, in particular, government employment has played in a lot of the positive headlines I've seen that basically over the last several months that almost 30 percent of the new jobs numbers have come from government employment. I believe in November it was almost $50,000 uh, or 50,000 50, jobs that were factored in there. So it was a large percentage of the new job gains. And what's interesting is I've got a, a good buddy of mine who um, I must admit is a Fed. Uh, he works for the, the federal bureaucracy, um, uh, but uh, a good, good Austrian though, so he he, he understands the, the circus around him. I'm gonna, not gonna not gonna fault him for that. Um, but he was talking about how the um, him and his colleagues are getting a uh, federal increase in their salaries of over five percent this year, and so it's very interesting. That as the Fed in the official line is, don't worry, inflation is now you know around three uh, percent. We are we're trending in the right direction. The way that the Fed is treating their own employees is recognizing that the actual cost of living is you know over five percent <laughs> needed to maintain that quality of life that they enjoy so much. And so some of these, so they get, and, and and of course when we talk about government employment, you know that that, that as uh, the same way that. Uh, 
you know, some of our, our measurements uh, would, would further, would, would double count against GDP numbers, the extent of, of government spending and the, the negative consequences that has on the real economy. Um, some of those job numbers should see, be seen as, as increased anchors on the productive class of society. And some of those aspects, um, when you dive into the weeds of both the, the jobs numbers that they tout and as, uh, as well as how government treats their own employees relative to their official numbers, is, uh, is something that our, our audience uh, should, should also keep in mind uh, when we talk about just this, uh, this surreally performing economy. Well, speaking of government spending, uh, let's let's look a bit at the at the importance of the debt in the current debate over interest rates and uh, the the economy right now, right? Because there's Mark, there's there are at least three hard places slash rocks that the Fed is caught between. Um, there is the issue. Okay, they want they want to get inflation down for political reasons, but they also want job jobs and employment to be high, also for political reasons, and probably just because they would rather have it that way. But then there's a third issue where, and so that that affects, well, okay, what, how much should we force down interest rates? But there's another issue that gives them another uh, motivation to push down interest rates, and that's payments on the huge federal debt, which is now, I think, $33.8 trillion, uh, as of the other day. Uh, so they have, they know that when interest rates are high, the federal government needs to come up with much larger payments to issue new debt um, because the yields are higher. That means higher payments on the federal debt. And so I can see why he would be, why Powell would be happy that overall interest rates are coming down. That probably makes it easier to make a case for uh, forcing back down um, interest rates, or at least getting back down interest rates on federal debt. But that if that's guiding policy, can't that be problematic in the future? Uh, I, I guess it just kind of depends on where where do you think the Fed is going to come down on that? Is it going to be desperate enough to loosen up the money supply just so it can get interest rates back down for the huge federal debt, which would lead to inflation? Uh, or is it going to take a harder line on inflation and and risk uh, even more budget cuts to service the debt at the federal level, which is its own political problem. Um, th this all could lead, if it does choose to just have more inflation in order to just make payments on the debt more easily, that takes us down a debt spiral avenue. So uh, do you have any ideas about where, <laughs> where the Fed might be going on this? I know that um, Janet Yellen continues to to pipe up every now and then about oh yeah things are fine we we now's a good time to push down rates again um, because of course payments on the debt are a huge uh, concern of hers directly um, wh where do you think the political situation is trending on that well long term the long term outlook in Washington D C indeed the only outlook time wise in Washington D C is the next election. So I don't think Powell is going to make any move whatsoever. He's not going to say a thing. I think the only thing Janet Yellen's going to do is try to spin a nice story about it, like a you know Jewish grandmother should. Um, <laughs> but they're not going to do anything about it in Washington, D.C. They're going to continue to spend as fast uh, as they possibly can. They're going to give away the store, anything really, uh, to spend money now, uh, no matter what it is, borders, wars, uh, it doesn't really matter, weapons, uh, they're just going to spend, 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 and if they have to borrow the money, they're going to borrow the money uh, because election day is the only thing, the only game in town. And so I think we're going to see a lot of uh, cooperation between the political parties, politicians in Washington, the branches of government, um, the fiscally oriented branches of government, uh, they're all going to be on the same page. There's going to be less uh, dispute in the House of Representatives. They're going to be uh, getting along better. They don't want to send uncertainty and disruptions from Washington into stock markets or into the economy. So they're going to do uh, as little harmful things. Um, and 
you know, of course, spending and deficits is also harmful, but it does help get them reelected. And that's really the only thing between now uh, and election day uh, is more cooperation, more bipartisanship, uh, more intergovernmental cooperation. Um, now, of course, uh, on the election front, there's still a lot of pissed off voters. Uh, there's a lot of alternative candidates. Um, there's a lot of uh, disruption uh, going on within the system. Uh, and that's exactly what the incumbents are fighting against. And uh, so that's, I think, what the general outlook, I think there's going to be a lot of candidates at various levels who are going to be complaining about issues of the national debt, uh, of runaway government spending. Uh, and that's a good thing. And hopefully many of them will get elected uh, as new members of government at the federal and state level. Uh, that's what we can hope for. But as far as the incumbents are concerned right now, they're just keeping their head down, biding their time, uh, hoping to get reelected. Um, so no major movements uh, solving any of those problems uh, be for the next 10 or 11 months. Well, as a, just a final issue then, uh, let's talk about the confidence in the dollar. Um, and notice that the price of gold in dollars, it's up. And historically, this has reflected somewhat the confidence in uh, the dollar as a good place to keep your wealth, as a, uh, as a medium of exchange into the future. Um, but this has been a topic of much debate is, right, every time we look at the dollar, it's, it seems relatively fine because most other currencies are even worse because their central banks are even more irresponsible. And so do you, do you think the, the new highs in the dollar price reflects any real deterioration in the dollar or is this just a, a temporary blip um, or is it a sign of a longer trend? Well, we've had you know decades now where the dollar has grown in prominence around the world. Other central banks and their currencies have depreciated uh, greatly against the dollar. And the dollar has been strong as, you know, the leading trade currency, the leading reserve currency, uh, the leading military power um, that's willing to flex its muscles to defend its currency. Um, and, and so everything has been a big push into the dollar. Uh, and I think that recent events may be a sign that we've reached um, an inflection point, a pivot of sorts, um, and that certainly over the long run, uh, the next couple of decades, I think the dollar is going to grow, uh, un it's going to fall under uh, increasing pressure uh, because of a decline in our military status, our decline as a world economic power, and as alternatives uh, emerge in terms of uh, probably gold and silver, uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, uh, and hopefully maybe some better uh, fiat currencies as well. Um, you know, there has there's certainly been talk um, about BRICS and the BRIC currency, but it's that's basically all it's been uh, to this point. But certainly longer run, um, I see the, um, the dollar going through a, um, a very significant negative phase. All right. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode of Radio Rothbard. Uh, thank you, Mark, for joining us today. Ryan, before we go, I do want to uh, take a, a moment to shout out a um, follower of Radio Rothbard who uh, had some comments on our last episode talking about state-level issues, and they were upset that we did not mention Tennessee getting Defend the Guard legislation. Um, on the on the docket uh, bill submitted there. So I do 
do want to give a shout out to our, our loyal listeners that are keeping up up to date on some of the issues that we talk about here. So way to go, Tennessee. I know the liber- a lot of libertarian activists in that state were big on that. So I just wanted to give them a shout out going into the holiday season. Go well, volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're not listening to every single episode of Radio Rothbard, what is your problem? You should know all about the <laughs> Make a New Year's resolution to fix that problem. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of that, thank you, uh, everyone. We will uh, be back next week with, um, I think, one of our, our year-end uh, episodes. We'll, we'll, um, we'll hazard some predictions, I think, for 2024 in the next one um and so uh, we will be back at least i think one more time this year and uh, thanks again mark thanks though and we'll see you next time Hey guys, this is Tho Bishop with Radio Rothbard and we always love having Dr. Mark Thornton on Again, as we mentioned during the show, if you're not checking out his podcast, Minor Issues, which are short, succinct bits of economic commentary, his most recent episode was on greenwashing and uh, the way that uh, firms kind of can launder the reputation by promoting all sorts of green environmentalist causes. And so we've got a special treat for you guys. Keep listening, and we're going to play that episode. If it's not yet on your podcast uh, lineup, You can find Minor Issues on all major podcast platforms or follow the show at Mises.org slash Minor Issues. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Minor Issues podcast. I'm Mark Thornton at the Mises Institute. Greenwashing is a relatively new term to describe false and misleading claims of environmental benefits of a product or business practice. The point is that companies can advertise their efforts to be green while continuing various profitable activities that environmentalists considered harmful. The idea here is that companies are gaming the system or profiting off of well-intentioned, sustainably-minded consumers. The term was coined 40 years ago by a student in response to a hotel that wanted customers to reuse the towels in their rooms in order to save the environment and, of course, save money for the hotel. As an Austrian school economist, I can agree here with the environmentalist to a point, but let's see how far on the other side of the bridge they are willing to go. Let's start with the idea that human beings are motivated to achieve their goals. That's true whether you are Mother Teresa trying to save bodies and souls, corporate CEOs, or a heroin addict just trying to stay drugged up. It even includes environmental do-gooders. In the words of mainstream economists, everybody wants to maximize their utility, however they want to define it, and minimize their cost. The difference between utility, revenues, and good feelings is set against labor, expenses, and psychic toil. No matter how or what you are measuring, the difference between the cost and benefits can be called profit, psychic, material, or whatever you want. Environmentally minded people have put much pressure on companies, nudged them, boycotted them, and turned their dollars over to companies with green profiles like Patagonia. Those people have also put pressure on politicians to do the right thing. Special interest groups have likewise put pressure on politicians. In the case of governments, bureaucracies and NGOs have also created additional pressure in the form of propaganda, pseudoscience, red tape, legislation, etc. Please note, I am not saying that everything environmentalist about science is wrong, far from it. But at the same time, no one can deny that scientists have fudged and defrauded the science and revealed themselves as a group of biased and unscientific people particularly those scientists who are dependent upon government research grants. Industry scientists also have a green agenda. 
They want to get more electricity out of every lump of coal. They look to conserve resources, that is, costs, for all the products they are involved with, subject to what consumers actually want. That is why I've heard many Austrian school economists describe themselves as conservationists in contrast to environmentalists. This is based on the idea that the free market does the best job at conserving and allocating scarce resources particularly over time. Deviation from this constrained agenda hurts consumers, businesses, themselves, employment, pensions, etc., and very often hurt the environment as well. Those losses and harms are difficult to see, but imagine a hypothetical situation where Apple iPhones have been giving off a toxic pollutant that eventually causes blindness and what that might do to the stock price of Apple if that information was revealed. Do incentives work to protect the consumer most of the time? Of course they do. Businesses have had their profit agenda sort of genetically modified by the green agenda. Environmentalists can see greenwashing, but they cannot see the damage that the green agenda does to the environment itself. The direct cause of this mutation is regulations, rules from the bureaucracy, carbon taxes, ESG ratings, etc., designed to protect the environment, but that ultimately promote the waste of resources and the diversion of resources in inefficient directions. Efficiency is a turnoff for many, but it is directly related to environmental concerns. It's also what causes greenwashing. Hence, businesses are indeed gaming the system, trying to profit an environment that is deluged with green constraints. And I agree, it's not good for the environment.